So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, our fifth part of our Parked at Home discussion series. Uh, over the past few weeks, we've talked about planned communities, human constructed waterways, soaring to new heights with family, and the persistent fight for equality. Today, we'll be leaving our atmosphere and moving towards the stars. We're going to be talking about space, specifically how two National Park Service units have close bonds to the exploration of that final frontier. Perhaps we could refer to tonight's presentation as Parks in Space. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Mello, and I'm a park ranger at Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park. And I'm very excited to be spending yet again another Thursday evening here with all of you. I am joined tonight by my colleague, Allison Horrocks. Allison uh, will be doing uh, the tech guru stuff for the night. So if you do have any technical difficulties or are in need of any assistance throughout the course of the presentation, feel free to direct those comments or questions to Allison directly. And if you do have any general comments about any of the topics uh, that we're covering here tonight, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll be sure to answer those questions as the night goes on. I would also like to thank the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor for partnering with us on this series, allowing us to use their Zoom platform. Uh, we literally could not do this without them. So thank you to the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor for co-hosting this series with us. This program is being recorded, so feel free to turn your cameras on or off, whatever you feel the most comfortable with, and please remain on mute for the duration of our formal part of our presentation this evening. I'm joined in today's discussion by Laura Henning of Canaveral National Seashore. Laura is the Chief of Interpretation and Visitor Services at Canaveral Nas National Seashore, and we're extremely grateful and happy to have her joining us here this evening. You know, as a kid, I always wanted to be an astronaut. It was something about the lure of what lies beyond our home planet that attracted me to this idea. But young Mark certainly was not the only person to ever have an affinity for soaring towards the stars. Humans have always been fascinated with the cosmos. We have long looked to the heavens for answers to try to better understand our human condition. Longing, for, longing to reach out and touch the stars, we were driven in the mid 20th century to push human endurance and technology to its limits. Undoubtedly, our discussion two weeks ago with Wright Brothers National Memorial was a first pivotal step in achieving that ultimate dream of soaring beyond our own atmosphere. But it was far from the only step. Tonight, we're going to discuss how one of the Blackstone's park nodes played an important role in allowing humans to not just land, but more importantly, walk on the moon, and how a national seashore in Florida shares some very close working relations with one of NASA's preeminent facilities, the Kennedy Space Center. But to get started, let's talk about an unassuming little mill village nestled on the banks of the Blackstone River in Cumberland, Rhode Island, the village of Ashton. And so here on your screen is once again that map that for those of you who have been with us for the past five weeks have seen now for the fifth time. Uh, but if you're joining us for the first time, right, Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park is composed of six separate park nodes. And nodes, again, is National Park Service lingo terminology for these isolated sites, these non-contiguous sites, each one spread across the valley, which helps to further tell that story of industrialization in the Blackstone River Valley. And for the past two weeks, we've been north of the border, if you will, up in Massachusetts, talking about Whitensville and Hopedale. But this week, we're going to journey back south of the border into Rhode Island, and we're going to talk about the mill village of Ashton. And so as we look at the map here on your screen, of course, that blue chunk, that blue line running down your screen is that main trunk of the Blackstone River. And each one of the National Park Service arrowheads indicating just one of those six sites across the valley. And the one that we're going to talk about today located in Cumberland, Rhode Island, is now in that black circle uh, on the east bank of the Blackstone River, uh, just a little ways north of Providence and Pawtucket, Rhode Island. 
The story of Ashton began in the 1810s, uh, and it's there that we see the original mill village being built in and around 1810. Uh, so here on this map, you'll notice that the Blackstone River runs right through uh, the map here, and on the west bank of the river, in what at that time was Smithfield, Rhode Island, but today is Lincoln, Rhode Island, you will notice these uh, black rectangles, um, some of which are uh, in a blue colored uh, field. And those uh, rectangles within the blue colored field indicate that original mill in Mill Village that was constructed in the 18 teens. Eventually, uh, a man by the name of Wilbur Kelly will purchase this uh, very small operation from its original investors and will turn over operations of this mill to his former employers, uh, Brown and Ives. Prior to getting involved in the textile industry, Wilbur Kelly was a ship's captain working for Brown and Ives. Similarly, Brown and Ives, these merchant mariners based in Providence who sailed the globe uh, and were very involved in the China trade at the time in the early 19th century, are also going to make this transition from being a merchant uh, marine operation to investing in the textile industry. And Brown and Ives is going to form a company known as the Lonsdale Company. And uh, Wilbur Kelly will go on to work for the Lonsdale Company. Uh, and the Lonsdale Company will have several mill villages spread across the valley, most notably up in Blackstone, Massachusetts, and also about three miles south of this site of Ashton, down in uh, what would be called the village of Lonsdale in both Lincoln and Cumberland, Rhode Island, about three miles south of this particular spot that we're talking about. But as the decades passed and textile production became more profitable, especially in the wake of the American Civil War, the Lonsdale Company by the 1860s decides that it wants to expand its operations. And they're going to build a brick mill 12 times the size of the original Kelly Mill on the opposite bank of the Blackstone River on the east bank, which is that large rectangular uh, black rectangular piece that you see on the map right along the banks of the river in uh, that yellow shaded field. That is the new Ashton Mill. And so we can refer to Ashton really kind of as two, uh, two integrated but also separate experiments in textile production. Old Ashton on the west bank of the river and new Ashton on the east bank of the river. Also with the new mill was a new mill village which was built uh, with it. And so all of the rectangles that you see off to the right of the Ashton Mill that are also in that yellow field, those are uh, the mill houses where the mill workers would have lived and their families. Up along the road that runs uh, north-south on the map is a school, a church, two stores, and these buildings over here being the manager houses. So they're building this uh, Rhode Island system uh, mill village here on the banks of the river in the 1860s. Now, if you think back to two weeks, three weeks ago now, holy moly, how time flies, right? Um, to three weeks ago, when we talked about the Blackstone Canal, we talked about the Blackstone River State Park, which is just on the opposite side of the Blackstone River from New Ashton, in what we could refer to as Old Ashton. And right there running down the map is the Blackstone Canal. Now by the 1860s, right, as we talked about a few weeks ago, the Blackstone Canal was already closed for well over 20 years by 1867 when construction begins on the Ashton Mill, the new Ashton Mill. And so where do they build their new mill and their new mill village? Not along the Blackstone Canal on the west bank of the river, but rather along the railroad that we see running north-south on the map, the Providence and Worcester Railroad. And so they move these new operations to the east bank of the river to utilize that railroad. Here on this slide, you'll notice on the left side of your screen an image of that original Kelly Mill. It's a two and a half story stone mill at this point of this picture of the late in the late 19th century. It's nothing more than a skeleton shell of itself really. Whereas we compare that to the mill on the right side of your screen, the new Ashton Mill, a four and a half, a four story brick mill. Um, and then the railroad, of course, running through the center of the image. And then off on the left, we can see some of those new mill worker housing on the left. 
The Lonsdale Company remains a textile uh, company throughout all of its years, um, from its early inception in the early 19th century until its ultimate demise by the 1930s. This is a label that came off of some of their products. You'll notice Lonsdale Premium uh, Long Cloth. Um, one of the uh, things that they were producing in the Lonsdale Mill was a specific type of cotton textile known as a muslin cloth. And so this is a very fine form of cloth that they're producing in the mill. And you'll notice some of the very uh, uh, patriotic imagery here that they had on uh, their labels that they would put on things, right? Lady Liberty seated with a spear and a liberty cap on top of that spear and a bald eagle uh, prominently pictured. And also because it's a company based in Rhode Island, well, you have to have an anchor in there somewhere. And you'll notice that anchor there on the shield in the center. Uh, the Lonsdale Company would remain in operation um, all the way until the 1930s. And up until that point, people like those that you see in the pictures on the screen here labored in that mill, working the spinning machines, working the looms in that mill, and producing this cloth. It's a story about these people, these laborers, working in this mill for several decades. But ultimately, by the 1930s in the Great Depression, uh, the Lonsdale Company would sell off its interests in Ashton. And the mill itself, which we see in the picture on the lower left-hand corner of the screen, would sit vacant for a few years. That is until the Owens Corning Corporation purchased the mill in 1941. And this is where we're going to get into talking a little bit more about space and this mill's specific connection to space. Owens Corning. Uh, most of you, when you hear that today, may think immediately of fiberglass, excuse me, um, and fiberglass was something that they were known for producing, uh, the Owens Corning Corporation, and that's what they're going to uh, base their operations in the Ashton Mill around. During World War II, uh, the Ashton Mill, owned by Owens Corning, is going to produce fiberglass for the war effort. After the war was over, uh, they produced a wide range of products, including insulations, tire cords, and curtains. Uh, some of you who are old enough may remember the days when there were fiberglass curtains that you would hang up in your house. It helped to prevent fire, right, because it was made out of a, a glass material. It was much more fire resistant than a cloth curtain would be, so it would help to prevent the burn your house down um, from a curtain catching on fire. The research and development laboratory, though, for Owens Corning was moved into the fourth floor of the Ashton Mill. And it's there that researchers began to uh, develop an even finer cloth uh, made out of fiberglass that really uh, was extremely valuable because of its heat tolerance, its resistance to heat. It was heat resistant up to 2,500 degrees. And they would call this cloth beta cloth. Um, and basically, the process of creating this cloth was fairly simple. In the diagram on the right-hand side of your screen, you would take little glass marbles, and you would feed them into a large uh, colander. And there, those glass marbles would be melted down. And once they were melted down, you would blast air through them. And that would blast the melted glass through very tiny, 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 tiny little holes on the bottom of that colander. And that would basically produce almost a, a cotton candy-like substance of all this filament and fiber. And then just like you would with cotton, the really neat thing about the spinning process is it doesn't really matter what you're trying to spin into a yarn or a thread. It's all basically the same, whether it's cotton, whether it's wool, or whether it's, fire, whether it's glass. You're going to take those filaments, and you're going to begin to bring them together and twist and add tension. And the more twist and tension that you add, you're going to be able to produce spun thread or spun yarn. And then, just like you could with a cotton text, with a cotton thread, you can then take that and weave that into a finished textile. That's exactly what they're going to do with this beta cloth. Now, beta cloth is really important when we talk about space exploration, especially in the wake of the Apollo 1 disaster. And the Apollo 1 disaster, as they're running some tests on uh, the tarmac um, in the space shuttle, one of the control panels catches fire. And because, again, remember, these space capsules are so pumped with uh, pure oxygen. Pure oxygen, although it's great to breathe in, is highly combustible. Uh, and so there's this disaster in which three astronauts are killed because of this fire that is sparked on a control panel. 
Beta cloth is going to be used to cover those control panels in the space capsule after the Apollo 1 disaster to help limit that uh, potential of fire breaking out in the space shuttle. The beta cloth will also be used as the external most layer of the spacesuits. We see Neil Armstrong's uh, Apollo mission spacesuit on the left-hand side here in the picture. That outermost layer is made up of beta cloth, right? You're out in space at the, at, at the, will, at the will of space and extreme temperatures, right? This beta cloth is going to help to protect the astronaut and all the apparatus that are in the spacesuits. Also, the patches on these spacesuits are made out of that beta cloth and are produced right in the Ashton Mill. So this cloth is being produced there. These patches are being produced there. Uh, the cloth will also be used to create little uh, 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 pockets and uh, purses and pocketbooks, if you will, for the astronauts where they can keep personal possessions. Uh, we see uh, Michael Collins' uh, bag there on the left. That external layer is made out of beta cloth, so that way it wouldn't burn any of the contents, right? It would protect the contents um, of what was being carried in the bag. And so uh, there's a lot of people who think, oh, they made the spacesuits in the Ashton Mill. That's not true. They did not make the spacesuits in the Ashton Mill. What they did do, though, was produce that cloth, um, that beta cloth, which was used as a component part of a lot of really important things, which allowed humans to not just travel in space, but to go out in space, to walk on the moon, um, thanks to these uh, really cool, uh, this really cool technology. This is a neat video um, that uh, was taken around the time of all this happening, and it was uh, produced by a local news channel to kind of uh, quell the fears of people, um, especially after the Apollo 1 uh, mission disaster, um, to try to make people feel more confident in this material which was being produced in Ashton. And so we see here on uh, the uh, newscaster's arm, this sleeve that is made out of beta cloth. And this gentleman here on the left side of the image, one of the leading C uh, the CEO of the company at the time, is going to take a blowtorch um, to um, this sleeve. And so I'm going to hit play here. Um, and you'll see as the CEO takes this blowtorch and literally runs it up and down the arm of the newscaster. And the newscaster, although uh, this is muted and you can't hear what he's saying, uh, is saying, you know, I feel a little bit of heat and a little bit of pressure, but that's all. It's not burning my skin. So it's really kind of a provocative and really uh, uh, interesting experiment that's being done here on TV for the newscasters at the time. And of course, we thank the Rhode Island Historical Society uh, for finding this clip for us and pro for providing this uh, for our use. Um, and also on the left of the video, you'll see a space suit. Uh, that space suit uh, figured prominently in the research and development lab on the fourth floor of the Ashton Mill as long it was as long as it was opened there. Uh, it was something that they were very proud of uh, being involved with. The last little story I want to tell you about the Ashton Mill and its involvement with the Apollo missions has to do with the American flag that gets planted on the moon uh, with Apollo 11. Uh, there was a, a lady who worked at the Ashton Mill uh, for Owens Corning, who I was uh, very privileged with interviewing prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Her name's Esmeralda Souza, or Essie, as she likes to be known by. And Essie is an awesome woman. Uh, had a great conversation with her. Uh, and it was really neat to talk to her, not only about her experience working in Owens Corning, but also something really cool that she did um, related to the to the space uh, mission and landing on the moon. Around this time, there was a call that went out um, to several different companies to try to produce an American flag that could be planted on the moon. And so Owens Corning took up this call and they asked SC, who was working in the research and development lab at, at the time as a secretary, to take uh, this beta cloth, this fiberglass cloth, which had been uh, printed in different in red, white, and blue, and to stitch it together and to cut out stars and stitch it together and to create an American flag out of this fiberglass cloth. Uh, and so Essie, uh, as I like to call her, although she wasn't a huge fan of this, uh, the Betsy Ross of fiberglass, 
took all of these different pieces of fiberglass cloth and stitched them together and produced an American flag. Now, several companies did send in flags, a little over a dozen companies sent in flags, and one flag was randomly pulled from that pile to be the flag that would be planted on the moon. Uh, but it is very possible that S.E. Souza, a resident of Cumberland, Rhode Island, who worked in the Ashton Mill, uh, uh, literally stitched together, sewed together that American flag, uh, which flew on the moon. Uh, we do have elements of that uh, interview that I did available on the park's YouTube channel if you're interested in learning more about that. It is notable, though, that, you know, each state offered something to the Apollo missions. With the work completed by those like Essie and numerous other laborers who worked at the mill at the time, the astronauts were kept safe from extreme temperatures when outside their spacecraft and were also kept safe from fires inside of their spacecraft. So a uh, pretty noble and important work that was happening uh, in the production of that beta cloth at the Ashton Mill um, during the time of the Apollo missions. But of course, space exploration uh, didn't end with the Apollo missions and still continues to this day. So to learn a little bit more about the National Park Service's contemporary connections with NASA and space exploration, I would like to uh, invite uh, Laura to join in the conversation, talk a little bit about Canaveral National Seashore. Hello, and thanks, Mark, for inviting me. This is uh, my first uh, Parked at Home event. So uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me. And the story about Essie and the mill and the beta cloth is, is really fascinating and very cool uh, because Though we are right next door, like literally on Kennedy Space Center property, they still own more than two thirds of the property within Canaveral National Seashore. I don't do a lot of space stuff. Um, Canaveral National Seashore was established in 1975. We have 57,000 acres, 24 miles of coastline shoreline and about 37,000 acres uh, within the Indian River Lagoon, which is kind of similar. It, it's like a smaller kind of Chesapeake Bay area. So estuarine, estuary, uh, brackish water, that kind of thing. And the beach is, is your basic barrier island that you can see behind me. But back in 1958, when NASA was first established, they, they knew some of the things that were coming but they didn't really know what was gonna happen. They didn't know what rockets were gonna do, how much room they needed for these rockets. They didn't know what expansion looked like, were things gonna be blowing up all over the place, um, which has happened. Uh, so they knew they did not want what was coming to Central Florida at that time, which is development, which is still coming to Central Florida daily to be right at their back door. So the, the folks at NASA, before it was called Kennedy Space Center, obviously was called Cape Canaveral Space Center. And um, they decided that they would need a buffer zone and they wanted a big one. So they wanted at least 60 to 80,000 acres of a buffer zone between, pretty much between Kennedy Space Center and what the city of New Smyrna Beach, which for an easier reference is closer to Daytona Beach. So you can imagine the crowds you've seen on TV at Daytona Beach and then Kennedy Space Center right there. That was definitely not what they wanted. So in, let's see if I can, so in 1962, when the Space Center was established, or actually 1958 when, the, when NASA was established. In 1962, they added the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Now, even all of the natural areas anywhere within uh, Kennedy Space Center that is not part of the industrial part or as disturbed land from the space program is managed as a national refuge. And so we're actually three overlapping government agencies. You have NASA, US Fish and Wildlife Service, 
and the National Park Service. And I hope you guys are seeing the PowerPoint. We are not. Uh-oh. Okay, let me go back. All right, hang on. There we go. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, the picture on the left is the vehicle assembly building, which is, I've been told that it's the largest building by inside volume, not necessarily the tallest, but inside volume in the world. They can actually take a full-size space shuttle and stand it straight up as it's being worked on. And this was the place where, when the Challenger accident happened and then a, the Columbia space shuttle accident, this is where those shuttles were reconstructed to learn about the accident, to learn about what happened. So it's a huge, huge building. Like, what I, and I'm, I'm sure it's probably an ur urban myth, but one of the things they say is that in the VAB, it makes its own atmosphere. Like it could be cloudy way up in the top stories and kind of misty and down, you know, down below it's warm and hot and uh, humid. So this is the map of our area. Canaveral National Seashore is this, is the area along the shoreline. The green part actually encompasses part of the seashore, all of Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge and part of Kennedy Space Center. And then to the south of the Space Center, what was known as until just recently, uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station is now Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. And we know that uh, through, through the different eras of space travel and space exploration, we've gone from the Apollo days to the space shuttle days. Um, I've actually been at Canaveral National Seashore for over 20 years. So I have seen the space shuttle program. We've watched probably more space shuttles go up than, than uh, your normal, <laughs> your normal park ranger anywhere. Um, it's always been a big draw, but again, we're, we're a national seashore. The space thing was always kind of a peripheral for us. It was just something that was on the edge. People liked it. People wanted to come see the shuttles, but it wasn't anything, it wasn't really part of our mission. And it still isn't, um, you know, formally part of our mission. Just like NASA will tell you, they're not in the park service business. So though we're considered one of the best places to watch a launch, we don't partner with NASA on a lot of things um, other than you know public information. We do some educational things together. Actually, we're doing more now than we have in, in any of the past uh, space programs that have gone on. Canaveral National Seashore and it's 57,000 acres typically Right now, and in fact, right now, we're getting ready to go into our sea turtle nesting season. We get up to 13,000 sea turtle nests just on our 24 miles of beach. We have uh, several historic homes within the seashore. We have over 150 archeological sites. So you can see there's a lot to the seashore that has nothing to do with space. But had it not been for NASA and Kennedy Space Center, would the seashore be there? Probably not. And we wouldn't have the, the cultural and historic resources that we have. And certainly the natural resources wouldn't be preserved in the way that they are. So we're just going into turtle nesting season. This view, the view on the left upper corner that's kind of looks kind of darkish like at dusk, that's actually the view from the road going into Canaveral National Seashore on our South District. So you can see a lot of the infrastructure. The, the two closest launch pads to us are 39A and 39B. Those were both uh, space shuttle launch pads. And now they've been 
um, repurposed and basically leased by SpaceX. So the mission, of course, of the U.S. space program has evolved just as the transportation into space, space has evolved. Uh, it's commercial now. NASA pays for their missions. If, if NASA is sending astronauts to the ISS, to the International Space Station, or they're sending military satellites up, they, they pretty much pay for those payloads like a commercial customer. There are contracts that take place. Um, it's not NASA doing everything, building the rocket, launching the rocket. Um, they are still involved and there are still NASA missions, but we have their giant, basically billionaire contractors that are building and launching rockets on the Space Coast now. So we have SpaceX, we have Blue Origin and uh, Launch Alliance, Uni uh, excuse me, United Launch Alliance, which are the three big, big companies that you'll see. But the uh, shot, the picture that's down in the left-hand corner, that was a recent atlas that was taken from the beach. And so we've incorporated, what, while our normal rangering stuff, I like to say, um, is doing sea turtle release and rehabilitation, interpretation, uh, our, our most popular program is the sea turtle watch, where we actually take people out at night to see a nesting female sea turtle. We do, we do night sky programs. We do a lot of things that regular national parks do. And then uh, tomorrow we'll do this. <laughs> We'll have um, up to 5,000 people in the South District of Canaveral National Seashore, especially because it's a crude launch. Um, you know, in between the time of the last space shuttle launch, which was in 2011, to now with the commercial contracting at SpaceX and Blue Origin, uh, there weren't astronauts going up. They were, they were going up, they were, we just weren't sending them up. They were going up on Russian, uh, space uh, orbiters. So now we're getting back to the days of sending astronauts up, although tomorrow is kind of even more of a, I guess it's a hybrid mission because while these are trained astronauts, they're not NASA astronauts. They're not, uh, they're not billing them as space tourists. They're billing them as SpaceX is billing them as astronauts, scientists doing research and um, and experiments for for e possibly for use by NASA or for the private sector. This was one of the SpaceX. This was the SpaceX heavy. So the two little things on either side of the main rocket are are actually what get the rocket into orbit and. What SpaceX has perfected that NASA could never did or didn't have the didn't have the funds probably to take it this far was that that SpaceX can make those return and use them again. They have drone ships that are located about eight miles offshore, and they actually once those come off of the main rocket and the rocket is in orbit, the the thrusters come back down. You see them, you see like the fire underneath them go out. And a few minutes later, the fire pops back up and they land them down. It like, it's, it's like watching a video game. I can just imagine it, somebody there with like a joystick, just kind of, you know, okay, a little to the left, a little to the right, because they're landing it literally on a barge in the middle of the ocean. But that's, that's something really cool that, um, that, you know, just wasn't a part of what NASA did. Everything was kind of expendable, except for the astronauts. You wanted to make sure you got them back. But um, all the parts of the rocket, other than the space shuttle itself, pretty much landed in the ocean or exploded in orbit and were not usable again. So this is a whole, um, I guess, greener way to, uh, to uh, send people into space. And literally something that used to happen for us, maybe, I mean, at the height of the shuttle program, once a month, once every other month, once every two or three months, now is happening one, two, three times a week. 
We this month, I think there are like five launches. It, we sit in our in our team meetings and we just hope that we have them all down because everybody is interested in them now. It's we're one of the closest places to watch them, and there are so many of them that it's become it, it has become part of what Canaveral National Seashore is now. Um, and, and we've also seen that space visitors are not always the same as National Park or National Seashore visitors. So they may never ask a question about a sea turtle. They may never, uh, you know, make it to another interpretive program, although we encourage it because we do spend a lot of time with them. Because I will tell you um, that rocket science is not an exact science. So we have a lot of delays a lot of delays. It's kind of like the Zoom world where you freeze. Um, I've literally been on the beach. They have counted down the famous 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And you see the bottom light up. You see this whole thing. And then you see water come out of a tank and it all shuts down. At literally at the very, very last millisecond. And uh, so does everybody else see that, the 5,000 people on the beach and there's kind of a collective, oh no, you know. And sometimes they get it going again within, if it's still within the launch window. And sometimes it's the next day, sometimes it's the next day, sometimes it's the next day. Um, so we've, uh, we've learned to kind of roll with the punches. During the shuttle uh, era, the South District of the park closed. So, there were times where, and, and the protocol was we would close three days before a launch and we would open the day after a successful shuttle launch. That was basically, it was safety, security. There's only ro one road into the seashore and one road out. So if you have 5,000 people in there and there is what NASA calls an anomaly, um, which is something bad blows up, uh, then it's very hard to get people in and out and emergency vehicles and so on. But with the commercial launches, we have not been closing very often. Um, the Actually the space station are the people that tell us whether we close or not. It's not even really NASA. They have really smart guys down there that do risk assessments and kind of predict from the weather, three days out, two days out, one day out, where these plumes, of smoke and fire that you see where they'll go. So according to those, that's that kind of tells us whether we need to keep visitors out or not. And so on Mark, a typical day, go ahead. Can you just hit the little uh, uh, presenter screen on the bottom so that way the images will go full screen if you folks have asked? Oh yeah, which, where do I hit? Um, right down bottom next to that bar line there. Um, to your right. Right on the bottom of the screen, yep. Below the slide left, that little, looks like a presenter screen thing. Okay. That one, yep. Perfect, thank you. Did that do it? I'm sorry, you should have told me. No, no worries, all good. Okay. Um, so if you could see this crowd, this is normal, this is a normal, in fact, I think the one up in the left corner was one that was on a July 3rd afternoon. It was 98 degrees, 250% humidity, <laughs> and there was a four hour window. It did not go that day in those four hours. It did not go the next day. They did take a day off on the 4th of July and the mission ended up launching on July 5th. All those people and all of the park rangers were out there for all of those days because it was it was one of the very first space uh, SpaceX heavy launches and those are very popular because it's a very big rocket. I mean it it and we're so close. 39A, which is the closest launch site that they're using right now, they are still rehabbing 39B. Um, 39A is about two miles from where you see the line of people right there. Literally, when a rocket launches there, you can feel it rumble from the launch pad and it hits you like a concussion in your chest. It's loud, 
and you can feel the vibration. You can smell the rocket fuel. It's, it's, it is a, a pretty uh, different experience. And along with rockets, my, most of my career has been interpreting our 15 threatened and endangered species along with the historic and cultural resources. And as, as NASA comes to an age now where they just had their 60th anniversary, um, the Apollo 1 site is still on Kennedy Space Center property. There are launch pads that are still there that are becoming historic sites now. They're, they're not open to the public because they're in the secure area, but um, I, I foresee a time when there's going to be some kind of, of uh, national park that is all about NASA. And uh, I imagine Kennedy Space Center will be right there in the middle of it. And believe it or not, you can see this little fence there. That is the border, the security fence between Canaveral National Seashore and Kennedy Space Center. That's our boundary. It's been knocked down. It's been uh, hit by hurricanes. Uh, but uh, I don't know when they drove those stakes into the, uh, into the sand or how deep they are, but most of them stay. Uh, through thick and thin. And that's uh, that we have a volunteer that is a retired National Geographic photographer. So he's the one uh, that I give credit to for all these great rocket shots because usually I'm running around just, uh, just trying to keep people uh, from having a heat stroke, um, getting them water, sunscreen, because the difference, uh, another difference between seashore visitors and space fan visitors is they don't always know what to bring. So we've actually started doing as part of our website and we do social media posts about how to come see a launch. What do you need? Because you can't leave once you're in there. Once you're in there and we're full, if you leave and try to come back, you probably won't get in. We have no concessionaires. We have basically no potable water down there. We have no electricity or or running water. So um, if you're coming for a six hour window and you came two hours early so you could get a parking space, it's gonna be an awful long day before you see that rocket launch. I think the first uh, SpaceX heavy, everybody, all, our whole staff were on the beach and our regional director came down and literally we were giving away our lunches, we were sharing sunscreen with parents who brought little kids that had no sunscreen. We had people who came in their, in their office clothes um, or traveling clothes from the airport, straight from the airport to come and watch this. So uh, that was the one where uh, he sent the Tesla up, where Elon Musk sent, sent the Tesla up in the first uh, Falcon. So it's, it's exciting. It's different from our normal. There's one of my little buddies. I, to me, that's Canaveral National Seashore. But as uh, as things change and evolve, we are uh, we are swiftly becoming the uh, the space park rather than the turtle park. And that's about it. So whatever questions you guys awesome. have. Well, thank you for that introduction, Laura. That was great. I love that picture too of the turtle. That's that's really cool. Um, I think your presentation prompts a lot of questions for me personally and the experience of visiting uh, Canaveral National Seashore. I know one of the things that we we talk a lot about in the Blackstone River Valley, right, is this idea that there's a, a lot of positive that comes out of industrialization and those processes. Um, but there's also potentially a lot of negative effects. And some of those negative effects uh, were unforeseen 
things by the people who are living them and doing them, right? Uh, when you dump a dye in the river and it washes down the river and the color goes away, well, you may not realize the long-term repercussions of heavy metals staying behind in the water and polluting the sediments of the Blackstone River in the long term, right? Um, and, and so I guess my question, you kind of talked a little bit about this now, but what long-term uh, environmental effects has uh, the space race and having a space center right here in the heart of your national seashore, what are the effects on the environment that that has had, uh, both good or potentially most likely bad? There, I, I will say that um, NASA has a whole, like they have a whole natural biological division. Um, and like I said, they do all of the, the unindustrialized area that's still with, included within the uh, center's boundary are managed as a refuge. So they have sea turtle nests on their beach too. They have 18 miles of beach within Kennedy Space Center. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife go out and survey those sea turtle nests. Uh, they do, so they're always doing biological surveys. They get, you know, EPA permits and U.S. Fish and Wildlife permits and, and um, Army Corps of Engineer permits, just like any other governmental agency does now. Um, back in 1958, in 1961, in 1962, was that going on? No, it wasn't going on anywhere. Um, so, yeah, we don't drink the water in the South District of Canaveral National Seashore, um, and that's that's a pretty well-known local local knowledge. Um, things are getting better. The uh, I would say we we have a lot more interaction with the environmental side of NASA's team than we ever had. So. So that part of it is improving, but of course the damage that was done 50 years ago was done. Um, rocket fuel and all the things that go into making rockets and fuel uh, are, are not, uh, you know, nobody wants to swim in it. Uh, so we're really not sure. We know that it's had effects, but at the same time, some of the mitigation that NASA has done on its own property has improved the area. Like they can move sand around where we can't. So if there are areas that are eroding, sometimes they can get a permit. We don't do any kind of beach armoring. Ours is a natural beach. That's the way it is. It comes, it goes, that's what it's supposed to do. So NASA will kind of manipulate their area more than we do. Um, sometimes that's for the good, sometimes it's for the bad. We end up with their sand sometimes, um, which is good for us, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 I, th I think just like, just like you said, you don't know how long those effects will last. And just because the dyes disappeared doesn't mean that, uh, j it's just the color that's gone. Right, right. And here in the valley, we can't swim or drink or anything like that, the water that's here in the river either. So we can definitely yeah. really, uh, relate to that. Uh, there's been a few questions that have all kind of been based around the same kind of premise. So I'm going to do my best to try to capture the essence of all three of those questions. And I think it really boils down to the visitor experience on launch days. And you kind of hit upon this a little bit, but someone asked, you know, is the park open on launch days? Uh, it sounds like, yes, the seashore is Most open on time. launch days. Most of the um, time. And yeah. I, I would say in the last, in the last year, I think because we've been kind of talking about this a lot lately, because the launches have increased so much, um, we've been closed three times in the last year. And that's, and it usually, it has to do with weather because when the plume uh, blows, that's rocket fuel. That's that those fumes are from the rocket fuel. So if the weather forecast is that it's blowing our way, they don't necessarily want people right as close as we are. Um, I personally have been in the park where they've had test rockets blow up and they've evacuated us and evacuated um, visitors. It ended up being nothing and 
they were much further away from us than we thought originally, but there was an awful big boom and uh, we heard intercom, it's time to evacuate the seashore. So luckily it was like a Tuesday afternoon. Wow. Nobody knew they were doing any testing. It wasn't a rocket launch. And, um, you know, there were no, no after effects that we knew of. Um, but it's big combustible <laughs> thing mm -hmm. there. I, mean, I, I joke about like one of the jokes is NASA has their own fire departments. Well, if there's a really big fire because of a rocket, no fire department is going towards that. They're going the other way. So um, they do a lot of training. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I would imagine too, so people are asking about like the smoke and the effect on uh, visitors, but just even just the influx of visitors. Steph asked the question, you know, you see all these visitors coming, 5,000 plus people, I think you said, on some circumstances, yeah. right? And right now we have turtles nesting in the sand and I'm going to be the first one to admit I'm a historian by trade. I'm not at all a biologist or an ecologist, um, but I would imagine that it becomes difficult to try to manage that natural resource and ensuring that those turtle nests are not being disturbed by, you know, a, a family who's coming out to watch the space shuttle. So what kind of things uh, are done to help really try to manage that and protect the natural resource um, in the National Seashore? We are what is called an indexing beach. So all of our nests are actually pretty much mapped, counted, um, species identified. So say mid-July, if you were to walk down on a Canaveral National Seashore and look either way from a boardwalk, you're liable to see hundreds of yellow stakes in the sand. And then just underneath the sand will be a screen. So the nests are marked. And, and 13,000 in 24 miles is not so much that you can't keep people away from them. We've never really had a, a problem with visitors and sea turtle nests. Um, with 5,000 people, we still only fill up the parking lots to capacity and there are 13 parking areas on the south end of the beach. So, I mean, sure, everybody wants to be really close, but if you wanna be really close, you're walking six miles sometimes. Right, right. And, and what level of education does education in that play? As we as interpreters, a part of our job is to educate the public about our resources, right? So, and you talked a little bit about trying to to capture people when they're there, right? They may not be showing up to learn about sea turtles, but I guess what kind of creative ways have you all developed to educate and interpret the resource while people are there watching a space rocket launch and how can you kind of take advantage of both, right? People don't, we're a national historical park. So really we're protecting the cultural and historic resources here, but that doesn't diminish the importance of the natural resources in the valley either. So how do you walk that line between people are here for a space rocket launch, but really trying to educate them about the importance of, you know, not walking on a seat turtle nest or things like that or that's what those yellow sticks that's, indicate. that's where those long launch windows can come in pretty handy because typically by the boundary where we stop people from walking further south to the actual boundary of of the space center we usually set up a tent we'll have interpreters and volunteers there and say if you've got a three four hour window you have a lot of time to uh try and get them interested in other things going on in the seashore. Sometimes we've taken turtle watch reservations. Um, if it's in the summertime and, and, and people are interested, we'll tell them how to do that. Um, so we do make use of, of the, uh, the time that we have. And usually we put, we try and do at least one tent every two or three parking areas. So, you know, it's a little place for shade because there are no trees anywhere on the beach. So it's a little place for shade. We'll have some park information and we'll have volunteers. And usually, uh, actually most of our launch volunteers are retired NASA employees. So they really get wow. into it and they do the interpreting for us that as, as park rangers, uh, you know, we're, we're not the space experts in this case. That's awesome. Um, someone asked about uh, sea turtles and whether or not they come back and nest at the same beach every year. 
Um, we like to say they do come back home um, to where to where they hatched, but you're talking about an animal that can swim 8,000 miles in a year or two years. So in, in, the, in the tagging that we've done in the DNA samples that have been taken over years, they will usually say it's in the same area. So the same area could be 20 miles of beach, could be 30 miles of beach, but that's pretty darn close if, uh, if you ask me. <laughs> and, and since I've been here it's in, since the uh, mid nineties, we started out when we were recording nests in the nineties, we had about 35 to four, four 3,500 to 4,000 nests. In 19 or 2019, we had 13,000. So some things, you know, things were, are turning around, it's education, it's turtle excluding devices, it's, uh, uh, endangered species laws and policies. So it's, we're definitely seeing an increase in nesting, but a, a huge increase in nesting in the last 20, 25 years. And it takes that long for them to mature. A sea turtle, we like to say they start out bite size. In a year, they're dinner plate size, but uh, they don't come back to nest their first time until they're usually anywhere between 15 and 35. Wow. Very cool. Well, you've done a great job in convincing me to come to Canaveral National, National Seashore, not just to, you know, check out maybe a space ship launch, but also to enjoy the natural beauty and all the animals that call that place home. So let's say uh, I was to visit Canaveral National Seashore next month. Uh, what is the best way uh, to learn more about how to visit your site? Uh, and what are any kind of insider tips or tricks you can give us before we conclude for this evening? Well, we have two districts. So there's like, there's a south entrance and a north entrance and they both have beach roads coming toward each other. There's 12 miles in the middle. You can only reach on foot from either side of those. One of our, our north district is in New Smyrna Beach, Florida, which is closer to Daytona. So on the north end, the Playa Linda district is in Titusville, which is right next to the Space Center. Uh, when you go into the Playa Linda or the South District, you go right through Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. They have a great visitor center that's open and has all the information about them and us. And then we have a visitor center in the Apollo District, which is in New Smyrna Beach. So both of those are great stops, you know, you always want to stop first and get your information. Uh, we have a couple of historic homes in the Apollo district that are open to the public, mostly in the winter. Um, the body of water behind the barrier island is called Mosquito Lagoon. So uh, you can probably guess they didn't name it that because there aren't any. Um, so in the summertime, the trails and the hammock walks are very, very buggy. Um, I, I wouldn't say we're the Everglades, but, uh, but we have our days, and, but the beach is where everybody comes. Ne by next month, the beach will be where everybody is. And, and, we, and we get 2.1 million visitors a year. And that includes everybody that's coming to watch rocket launches and everybody that's coming to watch sea turtles. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Laura. Um, just in conclusion, the age of space travel is now taking a distinctive turn. With private entities now arriving on the edge of space in their own rockets, one has to wonder when and if travel may be a space travel may be a distinctive possibility for the rest of us. Will there come a day when we can visit the moon or when we can live in space? And what will be the environmental consequences of, more, of those more recent space travel on our own home planet? We don't know what the future will hold, but space will continue to spark our imaginations and push us to new heights, literally and figuratively. I want to thank all of you for joining us here for this fifth discussion in our Parked at Home series. I also want to especially thank Laura for taking the time out of her busy schedule to join us here this evening uh, to talk a little bit more about Canaveral National Seashore. 
Feel free to download the special park stamp for tonight's presentation, which Allison has dropped in the chat, and check out some of the links to learn more about both of our parks. We hope you'll join us next Thursday evening at 7 p.m. for our final uh, edition of our Parked at Home series, where staff from Tim McQuinn Ecological and Historic Preserve are going to talk more about the very simple plant that changed the world and forever scarred millions of people, cotton. For those of you interested in remaining on the call and having a more informal discussion, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions. But for the rest of you, I hope you have a lovely rest of your evening and we'll see you all next Thursday. Have a good night, everybody.